This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hello and welcome. This is Greg Cooper. I'm a behavioral neurologist at the Norton Neuroscience Institute in Louisville, Kentucky. I'm speaking today with Clifford Jack from the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, to discuss his article published in Alzheimer's and Dementia titled, Revised Criteria for Diagnosis and Staging of Alzheimer's Disease from the Alzheimer's Association Workgroup. First of all, thank you for joining us today, Cliff. This is obviously an important topic and a manuscript that's already generated a lot of discussion within our community. Can you begin by giving us just the primary take-home message or messages from this paper? There are really three schools of thought that are current today in the field about what Alzheimer's disease is and how it should be defined. One school of thought is Alzheimer's disease is synonymous with dementia in elderly people. They mean the same thing. View number two is that the disease does not begin until people have symptoms. And then view number three, which is the group that our work group holds, is that Alzheimer's disease should be a biologically defined disease. And I should have probably begun by saying that it's not my paper. I was the senior author, I was the leader of a work group, but this was a work group that was convened by the Alzheimer's Association. So the views I'm expressing here really are those of this work group. So our position is that Alzheimer's disease is not synonymous with cognitive impairment or dementia. Rather, Alzheimer's disease is a specific disease process defined by plaques and tangles at neuropathology or by biomarkers of plaques and tangles in living people, Alzheimer's disease is a cause or etiology of symptoms, while symptoms are an effect or a result of the disease process. With respect to the second definition, our position is that Alzheimer's disease begins as brain pathology in asymptomatic people many years prior to the onset of symptoms. The disease doesn't suddenly appear at the same time symptoms appear, but rather every other chronic or slowly evolving disease in medicine, in AD, the disease process is a continuum that includes the clinically asymptomatic periods. Another key take home for clinicians is that we advocate that the disease should be diagnosed by biomarkers. However, biomarkers are not intended to replace clinical judgment at all, but rather are intended to serve as an aid to clinicians in their evaluation of individual patients. Let's talk about biomarkers just a a minute. Uh, They've been around for a long time, I realize, but at least based on my own observations, they really haven't entered clinical practice for the majority of us uh, practicing neurologists. Do you mind saying just a little bit about how we currently assess biomarkers and how we utilize those results? These criteria that we put together were not intended to be step-by-step clinical practice guidelines for the practicing clinician tomorrow or next week. These were guidelines that were intended to synthesize current science and develop criteria for diagnosis and staging that would bridge between clinical practice and medicine. So a number of the biomarkers, particularly plasma biomarkers, that we talk about in the manuscript are things that are really just appearing in research papers uh, now, but they show tremendous promise. And we feel that this will represent the clinical practice of the future. We talk a lot about plasma biomarkers in this, in these revised criteria. Heretofore, until the last couple of years, the, the disease-specific biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease required either amyloid and or tau PET, which are expensive, not terribly widely available, or lumbar puncture for analysis of CSF proteins. Again, invasive, not something that many patients are excited about. Plasma biomarkers will revolutionize this, but they're just now being rolled out. And so that we, we feel that this represents the clinical practice of the future and that the clinicians will be using these extensively in the coming years. I think that takes us into the next point I wanted to bring up. You In the paper, these biomarkers are divided into core one and core two. Can you help explain that? Help me understand that a little bit better? 
we took, I think, a principled approach to categorizing biomarkers in these revised criteria. And we used several different criteria to categorize biomarkers. We distinguished between biofluids versus imaging, but we identified three major categories for biomarkers. And one is biomarkers that we call biomarkers that we call core biomarkers. And second is biomarkers of nonspecific processes involved in Alzheimer's pathophysiology. These would be biomarkers of neurodegeneration and inflammation in the pathophysiologic cascade, but not specific for Alzheimer's disease. And then the third category would be biomarkers of non-Alzheimer's co-pathology, which are important, like vascular or alpha-synuclein, which are important because Alzheimer's disease typically does not occur in isolation. It occurs along with other co-pathologies. Now let's turn back to your question about core biomarkers, core one versus core two. We distinguish between these two. Core one biomarkers are biomarkers of A-beta proteinopathy. So these would be CSF or plasma A-beta 42 to 40 or amyloid PET. And they also include what we call T1, because that is biomarkers of phosphorylated and secreted tau. These would be P-tau 217, which I'm sure a lot of people have heard quite a bit about. Core two biomarkers, are biomarkers of AD tau proteinopathy. That is the actual deposition of tau. These would include tau PET, which everyone I'm sure has heard about, but other much newer plasma and CSF biomarkers that we think are going to be useful for staging. Core one and core two are distinguished by timing of onset and by the intended use. So the core one biomarkers, that would be Emily PET, approved CSF assays and high-performing plasma assays, they become abnormal early in the disease process, and they stay abnormal throughout the disease continuum. Therefore, they're used for diagnosis at any stage of the disease process, because once abnormal, they stay abnormal. Core two biomarkers, on the other hand, become abnormal later in the disease process. They correlate better with the onset of symptoms and typically are not used as standalone diagnostic tests because they don't become abnormal until later on in the disease process. But rather, these are used along with core one biomarkers for biological staging. That's not to say that core two biomarkers are less important or unimportant because staging is a key part of these criteria. A lot of it has to do with the temporal course then, and the core ones, you will see those much earlier on. The, the core two, they appear later and they become increasingly important for the staging of the disease. Do I have that right? That's exactly right. So I think you touched on this at the very beginning of this discussion. Really, the striking feature to these criteria are essentially the removal of the the clinical phenotype or the clinical story and the reliance on the biomarkers. Why is that important? As I mentioned, there are these three different schools of thought. What should Alzheimer's disease mean, right? And if we just take the first one, and that is Alzheimer's disease means dementia, it is very obvious where the flaw lies there. If you look back to the initial disease-modifying monoclonal antibody studies, bapanuzumab, solanuzumab, the phase three trials, subsets of people in those studies underwent amyloid PET, and about a third of those had normal studies. What this means is if you use a purely clinical definition of Alzheimer's disease, about a third of people don't have the disease that they're being treated for. That's obviously clearly unacceptable for clinical trials, and it's unacceptable for clinical practice. The second point of view, if you will, is does the disease begin when biomarkers become abnormal or does it begin when clinical symptoms appear in someone with abnormal biomarkers? And our view of this, the view of our committee, is that it's important to be scientifically accurate. And scientific accuracy is important in its own right. And the data here is irrefutable. And that is that in someone who develops symptoms with evidence of Alzheimer's disease, the disease has been present in the brain and progressing in that person for many years prior to the onset of symptoms. That's what the empiric evidence shows. And in our view, a modern definition of Alzheimer's disease or any disease ought to reflect the most up-to-date scientific information. So what is the practical importance of this 
being scientifically accurate beyond just the merits of accurate science on its own. And our view is that the field of medicine, the field of neurology, and the public in general should be prepared for the future because the future for Alzheimer's disease, therapeutic intervention, has to be directed at prevention. So the most effective treatment for the disease has to begin when people, individuals, are still asymptomatic. Symptoms from Alzheimer's disease occur because affected individuals, they've already undergone substantial and irreversible death of brain cells. And so the most effective time to treat has to be before significant and irreversible brain damage has already occurred, which means treating asymptomatic persons. And so the field needs to prepare itself for defining Alzheimer's disease and thinking about the disease as something that begins while people are still asymptomatic. Please don't let me misrepresent this, but then would it be fair to say the underlying disease leading to what we recognize as Alzheimer's disease may begin 20 years before we see symptoms? And ultimately, we would like the field to move to a point where we recognize and are able to effectively treat the underlying disease to prevent symptoms at all, secondary prevention. Is that accurate? That's very accurate. So are we, is it, does our committee recommend biomarker testing in asymptomatic people? And I'll read you a very brief phrase from the paper. This is quoted from the paper verbatim. We currently recommend against diagnostic testing in cognitively unimpaired people outside the context of observational or therapeutic research studies at this time. So that's quote unquote. This concept is repeated a couple of different times in the manuscript. We actively recommend against testing asymptomatic people for clinical purposes. And the reason for that is simply that there are no treatments that are currently approved for people with the disease, but who are currently asymptomatic. And in the absence of any therapeutic intervention that could help such individuals, there's no reason to do biomarker testing. And I think that is a very important point that this group, this paper is not suggesting that we test people prior to the onset of symptoms. I have now seen one or two patients that have come to me in my clinic who have had blood-based biomarker studies done that were positive, that, that indicated underlying Alzheimer's disease. They had concerns about their memory, but at least thus far, I have not been able to objectively show any impairment in their memory. And I'll admit, I'm not quite sure what to do in that situation. Do you have advice on how you counsel such an individual? The way I would respond to your question is that first, if the question is, how or why were such tests done in an individual? Were they done on the basis of direct to patient marketing? Were they ordered by a clinician, et cetera? Let's leave that aside for a second. Just want to point out again that the scenario you describe should never happen. It would never happen if the recommendations in the criteria are followed because we couldn't be any clearer. We recommend against testing. But to answer your question, I have to depart from what our committee said or recommended and to just address your question by what would I tell the patient? How would I interact with the patient? Because again, the committee was completely silent on this question because it should never happen. But what would I tell such a patient? And first thing that I would tell the patient is that I would explain that to the patient that contrary to popular belief, Alzheimer's disease is not synonymous with dementia. It's a specific disease that begins in people's brains 20 to 30 years, perhaps, maybe 20 years is more accurate, prior to the onset of symptoms. And in most people, it progresses very slowly during this asymptomatic period, like many chronic, slowly progressing diseases. And because it progresses so slowly in this asymptomatic people, and because for lack of any more delicate way of saying this, rates of death from all causes, stroke, cancer, increase exponentially with advancing age, that you, the patient, may never experience symptoms of impairment or dementia from Alzheimer's disease in your lifetime. You may well die from something else first. But what our hope is that in the near future, the treatments that slow the progression of disease 
while people st are still asymptomatic, will soon be available, and that these treatments will, in turn, lessen the likelihood that an individual would ever become symptomatic. Now, to just follow on a little bit to what you said, what would I tell a patient? And I think this is something that people have asked me about. A patient who comes to you with results of a AD biomarker test who's now asymptomatic, what would you tell them about medical management? And the reality is that you would tell them nothing different if the test were positive versus if the test were negative, because there's no disease-modifying treatments for these individuals. If it was positive, you would say, don't smoke, exercise, take your meds, keep your weight down, etc. If the test was negative, you would tell them exactly the same thing. So the test does not change in test result, doesn't change in any way your kind of health recommendations to the patient. I think that's actually very well put. Let me ask you one last question then. Are these criteria something that the general practicing neurologist should be incorporating into their daily practice? Or is this more geared towards the research community to help drive the field forward in that way? Part of our objective was education. People in the broader medical community and also people in the general public, Alzheimer's disease, what it means, what the future looks like for treatments. But I think what we're doing here is we're setting the stage for how the practicing clinicians will use biomarkers for diagnosis, for selecting people who should and who should not be offered treatments in the future. So it really is a look to the future. It's not uh, intended to serve as day-to-day -day clinical practice guidelines for tomorrow or next week. And I should say that the Alzheimer's Association has convened a committee that is going to provide sort of day-to-day -day clinical practice guideline recommendation, but that it's coming probably next year sometime. But that was really not the intent of this committee. That's helpful. So we'll, we'll certainly be on the lookout for that. It's been a great pleasure talking with you today, Cliff. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. And it's been our privilege to uh, hear from Clifford Jack about his article, Revised Criteria for the Diagnosis and Staging of Alzheimer's Disease from the Alzheimer's Association Work Group, published earlier this year in Alzheimer's and Dementia. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes, or you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to